Although he's shooting kind of the wasteland part of LA, there's still beauty to the way he does it. And he certainly understands the light because the light in this film is exceptional. There's a person TCN's Nor Ali host, Eddie Miller, on Robbie Miller's work in William Friedkin's 1985 film, To Live and Die in LA. Seeing Faces and Movies is a podcast where each month I focus on the works of a different director or cinematographer, and each week I invite a guest on to discuss a film and the artist's filmography. Today we're talking about To Live and Die in L.A., and a quick synopsis of the film is, a, f- a fearless Secret Service agent will stop at nothing to bring down the counterfeiter who killed his partner. The film stars William Peterson as Richard Chance, Willem Dafoe as Eric Masters, John Pankow as John Vickovich, and Deborah Fiora as Bianca Torres. It's written by William Freakin and Gerald Pedevich based on his own novel, cinematography by Robin Mueller, directed by William Freakin, edited by M. Scott Smith, and music by Wang Chung. So today my guest is Joey Gantner from the Out of the Podcast film podcast. And what they do on that podcast is talk about film noir, which happens to be my favorite genre. I don't actually know how I found your podcast, to be honest. But I've never looked back and I've followed since. And I I remember when I first started listening, I was in Ireland traveling for a bit there and coming back and I was working and I would listen to it while I was working and just being like, oh, man, no one ever talks about these movies. You talk about your big noirs, but the noirs that you guys are talking about as well were stuff that I never really heard anyone talking about. So I just been following on since then and i know you also have your own record label where you release music so i'd love to hear about that as well but i wanted to have you on for this because i know your what your film taste is like when you said you wanted to do to live and die in la i was like all right you're the best person for this so it felt right right like that's why i went with it it was an impossible choice of course because i mean robbie Mueller is a genius yeah his name is attached to so many fantastic films internally it was very hard not to choose repo man as well because you, you when you come to your boy gentleman joey you just you want to talk film noir baby and that's why i'm here we're going a little neo today but it's going to mm-hmm. be great you know we got robbie Mueller's incredible work defining 80s neo-noir in many ways or at least just taking the baton and just beating the hell out of people with it and you know smoking it too we've seen the pictures and we're bringing you like some dong we're bringing you some defoe and um some (laughs) chong some chung some wang some wang and some good times you really can't go wrong with any of those wang wang and willem two different types of wang I'm yes. here for it. I'm seated. I'm ready. Popcorn's out. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that's a conversation. Like, that's someone who is is coming on a podcast. But yeah, I do a cassette tape label. It's called mm-hmm. Sludge People. If you like nice. music, I probably put something out that you would enjoy because I just like all sorts of genres. And I try not to pigeonhole myself, you know, in, in what I... Nice. Uh, and then, you know, I try to draw. I try I try to fancy mm-hmm. myself a comic book artist still. Maybe it's not happening as much. The ideas cool. are, are formulating, you know. Along with having a film podcast, you are just a film fan in general. What your relationship yes. is to cinema. And if you can recall, when you first started noticing Robbie Mueller's work because you know with a cinematographer you don't necessarily pay attention to their name right off the bat of course yeah that took a while for me to to become that person Mm -hmm, Um, yeah which which i'm ashamed to say as as such a a visual appreciator you know like i learned comic book artist names pretty early instead of being like oh that's just spider-man it's like no who fucking drew that guy why does he look so good but i grew up in the middle of nowhere of connecticut in the united states i know this is an international podcast so it's not far from things but it definitely was like in the woods there's cows yeah. there's you know i lived <laughs> in a town of like 2000 people so the video store was there and there was no cable you know like it didn't come to these parts yet it, it has since you know progressed you can you can watch <laughs> something there and that was a game changer but in the beginning the video store was your best friend and you know we were going pretty much almost every day like Mm -hmm. had a healthy appetite for cinema and then uh, a a friend of mine and his father when I was like 10 years old we would just go to the movies every weekend for many many years and then 
my friend got his license and then it was just us. And that was always a big part. And then I, I continued to love cinema. When I first saw Down by Law Jim, from Jim Jarmusch, uh, mm-hmm. that movie looks so fucking good. That was when I was like, why does this look so good? And then I'm like, oh, wow, these other movies that I thought look good in the back of my mind. It's because of one visual master. And so yeah. that's that's the one I noticed. That's great. And- Down by Law is actually one of the very first Criterions I ever bought. Tagline for it to live and die in LA. Is it this one? I there's a couple. I picked the one that I thought was the most fun. Okay. Uh, but I went for a federal agent is dead, a killer is loose, and the city of angels is about to explode. That's an amazing tagline. Whoever I think that's great. I would love that job to write taglines. Absolutely. They would not be as good as that, but I'd like to try. The poster (laughs) of this is really good. I feel like it's better once you've seen the movie, you know? Yes. Because this was, I will say, a movie that I had heard about for many years, Mm -hmm. and it took me a while to see. And I think it was around the time that I realized Manhunter was one of the greatest films ever made, that I was like, what else we got? I know William Peterson from Mm -hmm. Fear uh, growing up in the 90s. Oh, okay. I know from CSI. Marky Mark uh, fingers yeah. Reese Witherspoon, Reese Witherspoon. Um, mm-hmm. very famous scene and he is the dad and uh, yes he later went on to CSI so these are things where you're like okay whatever you're just some dad and some yeah. cop I, what do they do on CSI science who knows forensics forensics <laughs> but speaking of some weird fact that we brought yeah. up CSI we're gonna switch to some to live and day and LA facts the car chase scene wasn't actually shot by Mueller because right. he didn't know how to set up the scene for this. I learned that while doing this round of watching this mm-hmm. movie and the research. The the thing you think about that car chasing is it's awesome, but it's mm-hmm. not like beautifully like, oh, did you see like the colors in it? It's just very matter no. of fact. And that's fine because, you know, like it's everything leading up to in the aftermath. It's it just better bookend because of it. Oh, yeah. The, uh, the guy who did it, I, I forgot who it was like, you know, another camera operator or something, right? So the guy who did it, he was a camera operator on this this film. So his uh-huh. name is Robert Yeeman. And he went on to be the cinematographer for basically every Wes Anderson film. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, he's that's other shocking. Stuff. That is shocking. He's the Wes Anderson cinematographer. Like since Bottle Rocket? Yeah, since Battle so, Rocket. So like he definitely got that mainstream cinematographer like on the low budget mm-hmm. and then like was smart yeah. enough to be like, you're the guy. Wow, that, that is very fascinating because- uh, I thought that was like my most interesting fact. You, I was like, you don't cool. see that in the no. uh, in the chase at all. And it at shows all. that Wes Anderson could be doing more action. He just chooses oh, yeah. not to. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> because I was looking at the name and I was like, why do I recognize this name? And then just happened to be looking at Wes Anderson's stuff. And I was like, who does his cinematography? Because I yeah, feel like yeah. it's the same guy. That's crazy. That's I, I just had a blast with that fact. So <laughs> keep them coming. Another fact that especially has been out there now on the internet a lot due to Freakin's passing and him talking about the making of this film. But we all know, or you're about to know, that the counterfeit bills were made by an actual counterfeiter who was in prison. Freakin employed him because he wanted them to be as accurate as possible. The bills ended up getting into circulation because one yes. of the guys on set took some home. His son or his kid was spending them and then got caught. The government's on his ass. Secret Service is being like, what are these bills doing out in circulation? How many It's do you that have? story and watching this film this time that I really got the whole Secret Service element of this movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, like just hearing like, oh yeah, the Secret Service, they don't just protect the uh, president and, and political figures. Apparently they care about money as it too. Yeah. You know, like, oh yeah. Like, gotta, gotta give them something to do, right? Freaking asked Wang Chang not to do a song titled To Live and Die in LA because mm-hmm. he thought it would be too cheesy. They did it anyway, played it for Freakin, and he loved it. And that's the song you hear at the beginning. That's what I especially was really noticing, like, Freakin, like, was like, Wang Chun killed it, you know, like. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they did. Everybody, they, everybody have fun tonight, band, which, that's another thing, you go <laughs> to this movie, and, you know, you see that red and green, you yep. know, music by Wang Chun, and then, you know, you look over at your friend, and you're like, what What the fuck did you just get me into? Like, I don't want to be jamming no Wang Chun soundtrack. <laughs> they did a fantastic job on this. Oh, yeah. Wang yeah. Chun is the greatest band alive. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know it before this this film, but I got to get a Wang Chun t-shirt. They should have scored more films, like, honestly. Like, they were very cap- capable. 
they could have been like an alternative to the dream tangerine tangerine dream yeah yeah well, of course freaking had already worked with on sorcerer so like he had you know he always like people steal from him so often yet this is the one thing people were like we're not going to take wang chung yeah sorry <laughs> everything else that. fair game but you know we that just did not resonate with us and it's like i i disagree i mean they, they really did some interesting stuff with this oh film. we'll get into it because i want to yeah. talk about at some point like just how this is quintessential 80s yes we're in 85 when this came out so i mean you're I, i'm alive at this point not for very long yeah i not yet at that point but it's we're still thinking about in- you though the last fact, though, before we get into this is not even a fact about the movie. It's just one that I realized as I was doing research. And I feel like I need to say it this episode because I haven't mentioned yet was that Mueller was actually never nominated for an Oscar ever, ever. Wow. That's how I don't respect the Academy. I was going to say, that's how you know how fucking awesome he is. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I have a fun fact I got from uh, the special features. The stunt coordinator on this movie, you know, the guy who was doing the the amazing car chase sequence. Mm-hmm. He was the stunt coordinator on a film that I'm rather fond of called Gleaming the Cube, starring Christian Slater, which also oh. has a, a pretty famous uh, chase sequence in it, which was a lot of why he got hired for this film. So, What was it called? Gleaming the Cube. It's a skateboard film. Uh, has Tony Hawk does a lot of stunts in it, and uh, he's actually like, wow. It. It's it's a it's a fantastic relic of the eighties that highly recommend. Well, if you're ready to get into to live and die in L.A. and Mueller's stamp on it, I'm ready. I'm ready to start living so we can start dying in L.A. What I first want to talk about Mueller is known for kind of working on smaller productions. Even if, you know, he's working with your vendors, your Jarmish, your Lars von Trier. And he worked in the States a lot at some mm-hmm. point in his career, post the 70s. Well, he, he came over with vendors, right? Like, mm-hmm. to the States, yeah. But he didn't really work on it as many Hollywood productions. This is one. It wasn't a huge budget, but it's still a Hollywood production. I mean, it's definitely like the the biggest, most mainstream director that he had worked with probably oh, ever. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. Exorcist had come out and been the hugest film at this point. So freaking is freaking, you know, like even if yeah, Sorcerer is like French Connection is there. I mean, of course, we'll get into it further with the car when we get into the car chase and oh, the yeah. connection to the old French. <laughs> but he was a, a huge deal. But at the same time, like the whole reason this came together and, you know, this this ties into at, at least as of now, hopefully the strike won't continue into by the time this episode comes out. But the all the um, writers and actors strike freaking wanted to make a non-union movie um, and mm-hmm. that in- included Robbie Mueller. So that was a big reason why he came on. Although freaking also was like, I saw Paris, Texas. It's a fucking yes. masterpiece. Like, look at that thing. I'm going to get this guy, of course. Like, mm-hmm. Mueller had just come off of an incredible 1984. I mean, the the one two punch of Repo Man in Paris, Texas alone, like My God. you could you could retire off of that. Oh and yeah, be like, I would. Retire wow. Yeah, that. exactly. I'd be like, I, <laughs> that's it. Like you know, there's two of the greatest films ever made that yeah. do completely different things to the viewer to the audience. Like you get everything you want from life mm-hmm. just watching. There's a double feature right there. You know, you add this in there. And you've lived a completely fulfilled life. But so a big reason was the whole non-union, like we got to do this cheap and fast. Like it it Mm -hmm. was especially more like speed that freaking like, because, you know, he didn't want people, he liked things to be natural. You know, the film was done with no marks, which is crazy. They would be like, the actors would think they're doing a rehearsal, but he was filming it. And it's like, you just did it. Good. We're good. Let's move on. Like, (laughs) <laughs> he would just work so quickly and especially had confidence that he would find the film in the edit. Yes. That's a very cool way to work, you know? Yeah. It's a working man's director. But it's interesting what you said about him coming off of Repo Man, Paris, Texas. Not huge Hollywood productions. This is a bigger one. They all have L.A. and in, in those films at some point. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. And the L.A. that is in Repo Man, Paris, Texas, and To Live and Die in L.A. is completely different. Absolutely. For two of us who don't live in L.A., I don't know if you've been to L.A. before. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah so have I. The L.A. that you are, you know, the L.A. that I know is probably different. The L.A. that we see in film typically is different than we see in all three of these films. You know, I mentioned that I'm a comic book fan and L.A. Mm-hmm. in a lot of ways is like Batman. You know, everyone's got a take, you know, and yeah. everyone has something valid to say about the uh, the character. And of course, I'm talking the city as a character. Like L.A. is like an anthology. Like it's very fascinating to see everyone's take on it. And no one is right and no one is wrong in a way. 
what I especially love about this film, it reminds me a lot of like Rockford Files. I love just like mm-hmm. <laughs> st- stopping and having a, a bite of like a, at a taco stand or something, you know, like especially where they are. It's like a weird like on top of a bus. Like I really noticed it this time. It, it, it was really cool. Like he really freaking definitely took you into some places that you hadn't seen in L.A., I mean, of yes. course, and some that you have. I wonder how Mueller was feeling because, you know, on the one hand, you know, like he's basically coming from Paris, Texas with his old friend mm-hmm. and then Repo Man with like a first time director. I, th- I don't think Alex Cox had done anything before that. If he did, it wasn't like, you know, on that scale. Yeah, no. He, now he's like with a well-oiled machine and a guy that wants to move fast. Like, I, I, I hope he had fun on this. Like, I hopefully he was like, oh, cool. Like, this is a nice chill you know ride for me and uh also getting to like show how i would handle the grit of los angeles as uh, someone who didn't grow up there or in the country Mm -hmm. and it's it's fascinating of course like the colors the red and yellow or red and green color is like you know the christmas colors it's fascinating those colors what they're able to do with it you wouldn't think they're not colors that work together necessarily Mm -hmm. beyond the the christmas setting but it it works so good i mean like when he goes to the strip club he's got the green and red going yeah um sometimes like they'll be like in a room and like the uh, the window of the door or like will have the colors coming out or after the car chase when the the partners are talking in the stairway like those lights are there like just where they found uh where they were able to put those lights in it's both very natural and gives it that look even the the um the jail that they're in the real jail mm-hmm. with the real prisoners inmates if i had to be in jail that's the jail i want to be in there's like <laughs> pink in there like you know, i know i did notice that it was like a salmon pink i was like yeah this is nice it's like aesthetic could be worse you know, it's like an instagram jail yeah <laughs> like my inspo jail cell you know <laughs> <laughs> Totoro might get a hit out on him but you know that <laughs> coming anyways a lot of actors like really come in before you got to know who these people were you know with oh, maybe yeah. the, uh, the exception of Dean Stockwell who was really having himself oh, a yeah. hell of an 80s you know at this point well he had just come from Paris Texas with Mueller yes and too. that was a big reason why he got cast here as well mm-hmm. because you know, uh, freaking was like, he knew him as a child actor, you know, with his mm-hmm. green hair and whatnot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so like, he was like, oh, I don't know about this guy, but he saw him in Paris, Texas. And he's like, he's amazing. Like, We got to have oh, him. Yeah. He's perfect. And another uh, thing I found out bringing it back to my podcast out of the podcast now available on your favorite <laughs> platforms. Uh, there is, the judge in this movie, you know, w- who has a great scene with William Peterson, where they're like, mm-hmm. hey, just sign this paper. He's like, I'm not going to sign this. And he's like, all right, fuck you. And he's like, all right, if you're that passionate, I'll sign it, that guy. Mm-hmm. He is one of the bad guys in the hotel in Touch of Evil. Oh, really? Yeah, who do does horrible things to Janet Lee. Uh, yeah, oh. he's one of those guys. Yeah. Wow. So, okay. That's a go. good bit of trivia. You know, I don't want to come here for nothing. No, I don't just like movies. I got stuff to promote. Yeah, as as you should. I did. I would have never known them. That's cool. Touch of Evil. That's another interesting movie. That's another movie that uh, I bought. And then they're like, here's a 4K. Yeah. (laughs) Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Kino. That's usually how it goes. That's what happens when you love things. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. I want to bring it back to Freakin and why he wanted Mueller for this film. So. A quote from Freakin himself, he says, Robbie saw Los Angeles through the eyes of an outsider. He notices details that nobody else does, which I think is very prevalent to why this film stands out and the visuals stand out. Because I think what Mueller is doing is he is looking at it from outsider, but he still wants to assimilate. So it's not kind of like being like, oh, look at the wonders of L.A. Because the L.A. in this film is not particularly beautiful. But what I love about it, like the opening credits where you're seeing like different people walking around because most of the film we're focused on specific characters and there's not as many outside background people, but the opening credits, you see a lot of like people walking around just getting food or going to record shops and stuff like that. And with their eighties clothing and the eighties music in the background, the things that you and I would do in LA if we were there, you know, exactly. And it's just showing those people and that's him being like, okay, I'm going to situate you and be like, you're watching this LA story. And then I'm going to take you to the real LA because when you're a tourist there, you're not necessarily going to be going to some dingy side street because you're like, I don't know this place. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, next time we go to L.A., we're going to take the to live and die in L.A. tour. And yeah, we'll go I'm to all have those to. places. Yeah. And whatever. I want to see 
Defoe's apartment specifically. Oh, yeah. That's a great one. I'm wondering how you feel about the way he shoots this city. Well, it's a big city, you know. It, it is. It, there's a lot of it. And, the, you know, different boroughs and, and whatnot. Um, mm-hmm. So I, it definitely, I do agree that, like, us as outsiders maybe find that we appreciate the outside look that we're being, you know, served up. Like, it's like, oh, yeah, that's how I would look at it. Like, yes, there's mm-hmm. all these people shopping around, but it's just like you're looking at it from like, oh, like uh, like ants in an ant farm or something. I don't yeah. know. Like, they're going through the motions, but like we're seeing outside of it and, and seeing the, the, the grit outside mm-hmm. of the glamour, you know, and, and that's what's so cool. I mean, like the big theme of this movie, you know, of course, the counterfeit money, but mm-hmm. they really made a point to have it be the theme of this movie, like the counterfeit relationships that everyone's going through. And, you know, you could definitely say that lens is being applied to LA. Like, you know, they're looking Mm -hmm. at how counterfeit the city is, like how it's usually presented is not how it really is. And it's fascinating. Uh, Like people compare this movie a lot to like Miami vice, which was going on at the Mm -hmm. time, but like, it is so different because that is more like seeing it from like, oh, look how like glossy and like fun everything is. And like, we're, we look so cool. You mm-hmm. know, we're not going to, we're not really going to break the rules too much and everything like that. Everything's so bright. And it's like, you know, things aren't necessarily dark, but there's definitely like a, a shadow applied to everything. Um, you're catching more of the sunset than the sunrise there. And I think it's like the flip side of that coin. I mean, of course, Michael Mann and Freakin are very similar that they, they mm-hmm. They like uh they they have the same themes that they're interested yeah. in. Sometimes I hear people being like, "Oh, this is Freakin's version of a Michael Mann film." I could see why people say that, but it's it's his own thing, and I I love both. Like I am a huge manhead. Yeah, <laughs> I love Michael Mann. Like I said, I mean, Manhunter is what took me to this. Like, oh yeah, Manhunter is another one. That's another great Peterson performance. It's a, such a good Peterson performance. And you start to realize like how different they are though. And this one, like, I mean, let's get into Peterson. Please. He is, <laughs> he is fascinating. Like he's just strutting the whole time. Like I've never seen like Strut an actor thing. act with his ass before, but no. like, he's just like coming out ass first. It, it's incredible. <laughs> like this, this man is confident. Um, I mean, it goes yes. with the character too. Like that's, that's mm-hmm. the life he's living. Like he's, breaking the rules and uh mm-hmm. he does whatever it takes and you know you do see his dick in this movie you do which is shout out to that i mean you, shout the, out the bravery of that the bravery of friedkin being like let's do this I mean, of course there's some beautiful women too but this mm-hmm. guy's like being like guess what <laughs> Ta-da! Yeah. it's great and then of course you get defoe he's he's got his butt and you know there's probably some deleted scenes out there and oh yeah and, and Defoe is just like where he's at in his age, like he's not quite where we know him. So he's just mm-hmm. he looks especially scummy in this movie. <laughs> um, and he just plays it so quiet. And uh, the direction that Friedkin gave him was just be Zen, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, he very much is that. And it, it's terrifying. Oh, yeah. I think. Um, no, I know for sure that Streets of Fire was before this and you kind of yes. get that clean shape i'll come on for that episode too by the way when you do walter hill i really probably will just be there for the full month so yeah <laughs> i fun. mean walter hill i definitely gotta do like especially oh, yeah. street of fire is probably my favorite i could start a walter hill podcast if myself i mean the warriors yeah 48 hours he's great he's fantastic defoe's great but as you said there is dick and ass in this movie and there's women too Yes. But it's very much a man exploitation film, I think. A hundred percent. Like it's it's not equal. Like <laughs> No, <laughs> it's all. very much it's like ninety percent men showing their bodies off. Anytime a woman is like being sexy, there's like equal sexiness of like, no, this is like we're both doing this. Like how how dare you try to like take this scene from me? And we're here for it. Absolutely. The first time I saw this, I was like, Are we are we gonna get dick here? Yeah. And then it, there it is. Like it, most of the time, they'll they'll threaten it, but it is yeah. full on there. <laughs> um, and it's just it's it the whole movie is just so natural like that. Like yes, when watching this, I, I I did the full credits. I think I usually do because it's such a, a, yeah. a Wang Chun ripper. But yeah. there's a post credit <laughs> scene where Peterson just pops up and it's his face and then it's just gone and like yeah, okay, it's not even <laughs> a still. It's like you can tell no. it's, like, it's like a clip. I think it was in the movie at one point. Too. It was it's even like unused. It's like. We, we we saw that footage. You did you forget it was in here? 
I remember seeing the very first time I watched it and being like, oh, okay. Yeah. And then reading about it. So I was like, okay, I got to stay again to make sure I see it again to make sh- see what clip it was because I couldn't remember. I was like, I definitely saw that like 20 minutes ago. So why? Why, we... why is it there? Like I could, why? I can usually be like, okay, I could find some poetic reason for these things. Yeah. I have no idea why it's there. No, we don't know. The film did its job. That's the editor, I think. There, I think maybe like, they just want to be like, Peterson, somewhere. Peterson killed it. Like, let's yeah. give him one last one for the road. <laughs> Let's bring it back now because we're in the 80s yes. and Mueller started his career, I want to say late 60s, going into the 2000s. But the 80s in cinema, specifically American cinema in the 80s, is just so of its time. You could not replicate it. You could try now. Oh, and they do. But it's, they do, but it never fully grasped, you know, what that is. Mueller coming as an outsider and not that they didn't have 80s over in Europe. They did. It's just a different type of 80s. The, the 1980s happened in Europe? That's insane to me. I didn't know that. I mean, it's a diff- It's so weird 80s. It's a darker 80s. I don't know what they were doing over there. Looks like in American 80s, apart from certain films, looks like they were having fun. You know, That's true. The crises that were happening don't seem to be happening. <laughs> No, because there's some great like British neo noirs in the 80s, but they are all like, mm-hmm. super super bummers. No one's having fun. No, you know, no one's Bob having Hoskins fun in bum- England. Bumming you out, yeah. Mueller's version of the 80s. Well, I have to tie it back to the other films he did around these the last two years. So, Repo Man, Paris, Texas, To Live and Die in L.A. All 80s, all set in those 80s times. They're not set in different eras. We've got three different completely fil- films visually. For me, when I think of the 80s, I think of the music that's happening, you know, and the type of music that I was like the more new wave post-punk 80s and the style there. Not Wang Chung. No, it's my more on the Weepo Man style oh, of music. That, that, what a perfect soundtrack. Like, that's more my type of 80s. Absolutely. Paris, Texas is more kind of your corporate 80s because dude sure. Sockwell's like that without being too stuck up. And then we've got... The To Live and Die in L.A., which is cop 80s. How do you feel about the 80s vibe that goes through this and the way Mueller shot it and the vibe that he's putting out in this film versus the other two that we're mentioning? I mean, I think this is a a stronger representation of of 1980s cinema in general. Like, I would definitely say, like, you want to know the look of the 80s? This is in my top five, if not number one. This, This is a look. Like, this achieved something. It was instantly ripped off what it was inspired by it perfected them it really just does so much cool interesting things again like the red and green like yeah such off-putting colors to me but I, they're <laughs> so gorgeous in this movie and they work like no one could accomplish that except for Mueller. like he just mm-hmm. found the ugly and made beauty out of it you know and you see that in like the outdoor shots and even one of the opening shots to the credits is like the sun setting there's a lot of magic hour shots in this film. Yeah, it's the way that the, the camera captures that shot or some of the shots outside where I can feel the heat through the camera. And I'm like, I, I was about to say, like, it's melting. I know it's sweaty. Yeah, you're turning on the air conditioner just a yeah. little higher. And I, I think that's like the beauty of his work where it's like what he wants to do with his style of photography or to capture the surrounding areas it's hard to feel without showing an actor sweating just showing a shot of like the sun or just buildings and feel like oh if i was there i'd be fucking sweating my ass off yeah my ass would not be as loose as william peterson's you know (laughs) speaking of because he did mention i forgot to bring back there is a scene where i think he's in and i feel bad forgetting what her name's uh the girl he's seeing who's like the informant's apartment And he walks to her balcony and the way he's strutting, I was like, sir, that's a catwalk. <laughs> you are not wearing any undies. I can see that. Oh, yeah. So it's, out. it's just at every walk, like he'll just walk from like one end of the room to another. And it is just a full on like butt strut. And it's yeah. like you have just commanded the room. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. Whoever manufactured those jeans. It deserved the nomination, at least for the Oscar, because they were doing some some hard work, but it was effortless. A huge thing in this movie is how 
and I'm sure it's the speed and everything and, and how professional everyone is, but it, it's mm-hmm. also effortless. And with, with Mueller, like he does such distinctive, beautiful work, but like, I feel like that's kind of like his signature. It's not necessarily like, mm-hmm. it's like oh, he has this specific like shadowy color thing he does. It's like, no, he just is very capable and will make a great looking movie and that it will service exactly what he's trying to do and like what is necessary for what's being done. And so like all these movies you know, from Repo Man to Down by Law, they're just like so drastically mm-hmm. different. And yet they're all visually distinctive. I mean, mm-hmm. yes, they're directed by incredible people, but people were at their best because they were working with him. Definitely would have benefited by continuing to work with him. Yes, perfectly said. Even when you're thinking of a Jeremish and his minimalist style of storytelling. If you don't have the visuals to back that up, it's going to be hard to keep someone's attention. And someone like a freaking who is more fast paced, and this film is very fast paced, the story is fast paced, but the visuals, you know, allow for it to keep in your story, in your head, I should say, because the story is kind of like minimal, right? There's nothing Truly. super special about it. We've seen it before. Speaking of his other work, for me, when I think of Mueller and probably other people too, I kind of think of his outside landscape, you know, photography. Mm -hmm. And there is that in this film, but we get a lot of inside shots. We get a lot of shots of people's apartments. Yeah, but also like where they're um, manufacturing the the counterfeit Mm -hmm. money, which of course you get that amazing sequence where he's showing you how it's done. I mean, yeah, it's great. is incredibly shot and he he shot that one, you know, like he Mm -hmm. was there for that day. He knew how to set up a, a counterfeit screen printing operation um yeah it's is so well done uh shot edited everything where that they're doing it in that like middle of nowhere mm-hmm. random like outskirts of los angeles like that's the good stuff and that really yeah you feel you feel the heat there and everything like it's it's incredible yeah i just love the way that the framing of everything because sometimes there'll be something just like the money printing Mm -hmm. sometimes you'll be in someone's apartment and there's a lot going on in that person's apartment or house but the way it's framed allows you to kind of it never directs your attention to something unless you really need to be directed to something. It allows you to kind of wander and be like, oh, look at that thing that's in that apartment. The only time I found that it was like very direct, there's a shot when he's creating the money and he's cutting out the numbers on there because it's showing you how he's doing it. So you kind of have to be like, okay, pay attention to this (laughs) because it's a serious (laughs) business. You know, we paid a lot of money for this to be happening. So let's put this out there. But you kind of touched upon it, but how do you feel about his inside versus outside shooting specifically in this film. They're great. I mean, I think a lot of times the outside stuff is what really stands out with him and the inside stuff's always good and Mm -hmm. and great. I don't want to downplay it, but I would say here, like it really feels like they're in perfect harmony. Like nothing is out shining the other, like even, you know, Mm -hmm. when you're inside all amazingly lit, the shadows are great and the set design is perfect. And it is just, perfectly framed and being used and again like freaking was like hey don't worry about your mark and stuff like that too so to like Mm -hmm. it really just shows like how well thought out everything was that you could keep it that loose and yeah so like you are just like in apartments or and and the contrast you know like willem dafoe's place is just so sparse and bare yeah (laughs) and he's just trying to be a painter you know he's just i get it you're just trying to hustle uh, you know, his, <laughs> his counterfeiting money was my podcast. I mean, hey, you got to do what you got to do. And I'm just burning art in the meantime, which, you know, the artwork by a real painter, mm-hmm. the artwork was like legit. It wasn't even like, oh, it's some random guy. It's like that stuff would be worth money that they just oh, straight yeah. up burned. Burned. Before I move on from some location stuff and we get into the big car chase scene. Yes. Um, I do want to talk about, because you can't really talk about Mueller without talking about neon and yes. neon lighting. And it's LA, so you're going to get neon. The neon is never anything that's not already there. So it's like you're driving along a street, you see neon st- signs, sorry, restaurants and gas stations. And then the strip club, which is probably my one of my favorite scenes visually. And you get like that green and red. It's just... yeah. It's beautiful. And then you see the door open at some point and you see the outside light shining in just to be like, hey, this is like the lighting that's happening in here. Just to know like, hey, it's like the middle of the day. There's no worse time to be at a strip club. (laughs) Yeah, it's very quiet in there. There's people coming in though. Oh, yeah. And in groups, which is why there's a buffet. Yeah. Yeah. You guys don't have work. That's fine. 
what what a life, huh? <laughs> no, no work, just all the time in the world to go to the titty bar. Jeez. I mean, that sounds like a dream to me, but you keep doing the podcast, couple sponsorships, you'll be there. Yeah, I'll be there. That's the goal. For someone who has seen like his other colored film, because you're not gonna get the neon and the black and white stuff. How do you feel about his use of neon? And that it's typically like natural neon light that we're seeing through the cities. Yeah, nothing felt forced. It's just like that he was able to bring out and find what the cities and locations naturally had. You know, maybe slightly enhance or complement. But no, it's it it it's really incredible. Like every scene, like even if they're just like in the Secret Service station, you mm-hmm. know, like those scenes are all just like well shot like i don't know like all the color choices just feel right yeah you know but, you know this is just like a movie you look at and it just feels right like i said it's like the perfect example i would use mueller for two examples in life one like what's a perfect looking 80s movie Boom, mm-hmm. it's live and die in la uh what's like probably the best looking black and white film of all time down by law like yeah i think what you said makes sense that like it looks right you're watching this film and you never feel like nothing is out of the ordinary it just feels you don't like... feel manipulated like nothing and nothing is trying to like force itself into like mm-hmm. oh we want it to look like this it's like no this is happening here it looks like this this is what it looks like i'm yeah. just capturing it on a slightly better camera than you would have had in the 80s in True. Your house. And, and it's just a, a complete compliment to every single one of the crew yes you know if you're working non-union you got a lot of probably like hungry like fresh faced people that mm. just are wanting to try some shit and what a perfect opportunity to do so. I mean, imagine having this on your resume. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. I mean, A, just getting to work with Freakin, but just B, like, mm. what, what a movie, what a film. Speaking of something that's a little bit, I don't know if it's out of the ordinary, I wouldn't no. want to be around one of them, but the car chase scene. Yes. I do have a quote that I want to read before we get into it. It's a little bit long. I'm going to try and shorten it as I read it. It's from Roger Ebert. Oh, boy. He was talking a lot about stuff. I thought (laughs) it was interesting. So he says, The great chases are rarely just chases. They involve some kind of additional element. An unexpected vehicle, an unusual challenge, a strange setting. The car chase in the French Connection was a masterstroke. Or think of John Ford's sustained stagecoaches and stagecoaches, or Buster Keaton's orchestrated the general so that the train chases the other through the railway system. The masterstroke in To Live and Die in L.A. is that the chase isn't just on a freeway, it goes the wrong way down the freeway. We have to preface this, we did mention this in the fun facts, this wasn't shot by Mueller. And he did this because he was like, dude, I don't know how to do this. I love that. I respect that. He's just straight up like, yeah, I don't I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not even going to try to fake it. And he's just like, cool, we'll figure it out. Like, And they saved this last. Like, So this was, they already yeah. shot everything except mm-hmm. for this because they're like, you know, hey, if we kill any of these guys, yeah. we got we got a movie. So like, but yeah, the, the I, I really respect the humbleness of him just being like, yeah, mm-hmm. I can't, I can't do this. But it doesn't feel out of place at all. You would never know. And also not only the humbleness, but also just like kind of the camaraderie of being like, why not let this other dude do this who yeah. might do better? And like, as we mentioned, look where his career went. Like he's Absolutely. working hard. He's yeah. doing great stuff. So he's working with the best action film director of all time. Yes. Wes Anderson, <laughs> as he's known, you know, he's, he's going to be directing Fast and Furious 25. I would, I would honestly love that. I, that would be the very first one I would watch. I've never actually seen a Fast and Furious movie. They're a lot of fun. <laughs> but, you know, we're talking film. Yeah, we're talking film. We're not talking movies. I, well, I have to put that out there as far as like, I like to have fun, but we are talking about a masterpiece right now. Yes, we got to get serious. I want to talk the car chase scene. I want to hear your thoughts on it. We are moving away from Mueller, but you can't talk about this film without He'll be talking back. about it. He'll be back. Um and you can't, you can't. I mean, it's the car chases. I mean, you could take out the car chase and it's still a spectacular film. Oh, yeah. But this is what makes it really incredible. Uh, I think it, it was very cool for Freakin to be like, hey, people love that car chase from French Connection. And it's a fantastic chase. I like car chases, but mostly they're not good. You know, like they're not yeah. done well. It's like very choppy. And then, of course, you know, we're coming up in the computer age. And- mm hmm. The, the intelligence is now artificial so oh boy but uh <laughs> so i really like it's really got to be good you know like the bullet chase scene of course is yeah. an old timer 
most exciting thing in a boring movie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Bullet has his merits, but you know, come on, that, yeah. you can't have that car chase and it's then Steve be like, McQueen. exactly, you can coast off of that for sure. But then you know, yeah. go watch the Getaway, baby. There's some fun. Also, the driver. Driver's fantastic. Well, driver is uh, uh what's his nuts? Uh, O'Neill. O'Neill, Ryan name? O'Neill. Yeah, yeah Ryan O'Neill. Uh, and there's a fantastic out of the podcast episode on that very movie for yep. Neo Noir Vember. So definitely check it out I if you want to my. It. Yes, there you go. But so yeah, car chases, give or take. But when they're fantastic, I will get on top of the mountain and they're my favorites. And so the fact that he wanted to top a very awesome scene mm-hmm. that he did and could have coasted off of that forever oh, yeah. uh, is very respectful. And he did it. He tried to do it one more time. I haven't seen Jade in a long time. He did do a third mm-hmm. car chase and that one is pretty well known as well. But this this is the one. This is, is incredible. Um, the fact that it is going against like reverse traffic. And by this point, you see that Peterson has just completely lost it. And now he's taken his partner, John Pankow, down with him. You yeah. know, like <laughs> so the, the stakes are incredibly high. They just they're stealing mon- drug money. And then now they got the cops after him, the feds. And uh like so this the stakes are high. And there's like not just one person chasing after them, but yeah. multiple people chasing after them. That's just brilliant yeah with peterson doing a lot of the real driving and real yeah. pan cow in the backseat going like hey this fucking sucks <laughs> yeah the, there is a shot where they think they're safe and then the the bullet comes through the window just like basically just missing him and i being like uh i'd be like sir i would like to let <laughs> off. please let me off at the nearest exit <laughs> oh and peterson destroyed like a several thousand dollar camera like crashing into it that was like attached to the car like it's not wild it, it, not at all um but it's that realism that just makes it work completely mm-hmm. it is edgy your seat material and in many ways the best car chase scene of all time that has been put to film oh yeah it's i mean freaking you know he had a hand in this obviously there's a lot of other people had a hand in creating the scene but he does sure. a good tense car scene we see it also in sorcerer it's yes. another type of car scene it's not a yeah. chase chase again or it's a race against time and that's like sense. If, if death was in the car behind you <laughs> yeah <essentially. laughs> well again if you like this car chase check out gleaming the cube it is the same yeah. stunt coordinator um and you want skateboards and car chase like there you go and christian slater I would now absolutely with his stunts <laughs> being done by a very young Tony Hawk. That's wild to me. It's and then Tony Hawk is also in the movie. Yeah, it's wild. Um, there's some other familiar faces. You can have a good time with that one. Yeah, I'm gonna have to check that one out. I don't know. I've never heard of it. That's cool. Sounds like we got another bonus episode coming, everybody. I mean, hey, that's <laughs> that's my type of bonus episode. I love the ones where it's like a random ass movie. And since we're a little bit off the topic of Miller, but he'll come in in and out. I do want to give a sh- quick shout out to the score we talked about. And then yes. the costume design is great. Everyone's yes. outfits are great, specifically Peterson and Defoe, who are just great. But I also want to shout out the opening credits. Like the title the design yeah. is great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful. I was like, I want to share it with that. To live and die. And then just like, yeah, in LA, like that. Yeah bloody crazy font it's so cool and also just to speak of the costumes uh one of the actresses deborah fuhrer who had all her scenes with um defoe she actually Mm -hmm. was wearing like a lot of her own clothes like she came in and freaking was like that looks awesome just wear that nice that's the the 80s for you oh yeah when people could just walk in off the street and be the coolest people on the you know on set (laughs) not like now where everyone's a loser like you're wearing that Everyone's Go depressed. to costume. They got something for you. We got something from the 80s for you. <laughs> Back when you knew yeah, how to show dress. up on your yoga pants. Ugh. You know. Just watch you me. Look at close. Nah, I'll <laughs> take that challenge. But there are there any specific points that you want to shout out that we haven't talked about yet? I do. Um, I also, just no. before I forget, also because we're talking Mueller, I got mm-hmm. one, one fun fact that we have about him um, because, you know, he worked with Jim Jarmusch. He did Dead Man, which is the final filmed appearance of my favorite actor, Robert Mitchum. So he was the last person to film Robert Mitchum. That's a pretty amazing fact, you know? I hadn't even thought about it that way. I really just like when I was looking through his filmography and I'm like, you know, and Dead Man, I don't really enjoy, although it has an awesome Neil Young soundtrack. 
I enjoy mm. it for its merit, but I'm not like, let's go watch yeah. Dead Man, you know? But <laughs> yes, final film, the appearance of Robert Mitchum and didn't, couldn't have looked better done by yeah. the master. So I love me some Mitchum. I knew that that was his last one, but it, it hadn't clicked that Miller would have been the last to, you know, shoot him. And yeah. his last film was with Jarmusch. That's a good way to go out. Absolutely. Know? I think when you look at his career, man, what a career. What there could a be a career. whole Mitchum podcast oh, and it boy. would last a long time. If I'm not a guest on that podcast, that's not yeah. a good podcast. Don't listen to it. <laughs> I can't wait to get around to one of his films. Yeah, I can't wait to see how you're going to get him there. But that'll be cool. I will eventually because he's worked with so many different people. So oh, yeah. I'll definitely get around to him. If you do Schrader, you could do uh, Yakuza. Yeah. Oh, I will definitely be doing Schrader. So I love go. Schrader. Although if you're doing Schrader, like there's a million there's so many. options. Yeah. There's so many. I mean, my favorite, as a side note, spoiler, I guess, for future Schrader months is hardcore. Hardcore is fantastic. And a fun fact, I know I knew this girl who uh, she had a giant hardcore poster above her bed. Oh, where it says like, oh, my God, is that my daughter? It's my daughter. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was very clever. I was going to buy a t-shirt with that on it. And now I feel like I need to. She's inspired me too. Absolutely. It's a great movie. Wait, but, but you said you had some other I, things you wanted to talk right. about. That's right. I said, not so fast. <laughs> <laughs> There's that conversation that's happening where Peterson and uh, Penko, they go mm-hmm. to Defoe finally to try to set up this deal. They're at the spa, yeah. they're at the gym, <laughs> and they're having this conversation. And as it unfolds, they're just going deeper and deeper until they're all just nude in a sauna and you can kind of like yeah. figure out if they're cops and check for wires. And that's just all facets of it is really cool. Oh yeah. Yeah. Just very neat way to unfold that whole story. It's great. The way that shot and the way the pace, the pacing is in that, because I remember the first time being like, this is a weird meeting spot. And they're yeah, all absolutely. Defoe immediately gets nude. Yes. And then I, it clicks where you're like, okay, now yeah. I know why they're here. He's like, I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> goes outside, talks to his girlfriend, like, oh, should we do this? You also, for the Fraser fans, you get Daphne Moon in this movie. Yes. It's hard for me not to see her. As it's very Daphne. bizarre. Very bizarre, but fun to see her. She's get, she gets that scene and the, a final scene. The final scene, scene yeah. With... Well, so Peterson's like, hey, not so fast. Check out yeah. my face and credits. <laughs> Gotta have this. Gotta <laughs> have that. Robert Downey Sr. is in this. I know. There's a lot that's, of great cameos. That's very cool. I mean, it's just like an awesome, awesome cast. Uh, everyone's mm-hmm. got cool stuff to do. The women and, like are, are just awesome in this. Like The relationships that they have with uh, you know both a, a secret service agent and a criminal mm-hmm. but it turns out you know like well the criminal aspect you know she she got out of it okay she got to leave with yeah. daphne but you know uh peterson's confidant her <laughs> she's still yeah. stuck in the system and now Pankow is just completely uh you know this this was a guy who uh really came into it like his family was cops mm-hmm. you know like he's like following in the family trade and just like is completely taken down by William Peterson uh that's a dark ending it's very dark yeah where he's like you're working for me now and I was like yeah you know oh, how no. you thought you were free no uh, you're with me now and we already saw how well that went the last time like this yeah. is not a good position to be because she also has like a a son or a child yeah definitely a child i think a son and he's just like nope you're working for me now not to talk too much about another film but i think his performance william peterson's performance in this really and i think you mentioned it before truly helps in setting up his character in manhunter because his character oh, yeah. in manhunter is wild as hell oh yeah oh, i always joke about the scene where he's just up in the tree <laughs> And he's like, why did you murder these people? <laughs> and it's like, sir, what is happening with you? You're having a meltdown. We really did not let Peterson off the leash enough. Like, he, no. he, he really, could have been great. He could have been something special. Uh, but he left us with some masterpieces for sure. I mean, he's like outdoing Defoe in this movie. You know? like he, oh, yeah. 100%. And Defoe <laughs> is like doing incredible stuff, too. So it's it, it's great. It's fun to see people play and you know like it's just this movie fires on all cylinders like everyone's Mm -hmm. just killing it everyone's bringing the a game everyone's hungry and it's got something to say like it's not it's not like hey let's just make another car chase film exactly let's make a cool film you know so it's based off a book by like an ex-secret service agent Mm -hmm. and then freaking bought like optioned it basically there someone was like you'll love this book and so which he usually hates suggestions which i feel the same way but this one was actually (laughs) good yeah like don't i mean 
Gleaming the Cube is a legit suggestion. Yeah. But well, that, film wrecks are different. We're on like, the level, so we can do these yeah. kinds of things. But if you're just some yeah. citizen, like, I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> you, we did not have a rapport. Please. No. No, <laughs> thank you. But this this book worked out for him, and he bought the rights, and he was developing mm-hmm. it. And then he would, like, go to the writer and, like, be like, hey, can you give me some advice? And then by the end of it, it's like, we basically developed this together. Like, you get a screenwriting credit, which is just nice. awesome. Yeah, a free kid. Like, it is he great. did not have to do that. And it's just stuff like that, where it's just like, if someone's got something worthwhile to do, they're recognized, and they get a chance to do it. And that's why this movie is just, it's innovative, just in a way of, like, this is how you should work and make movies. It's like, just keep it loose, you know, trust yeah. everybody. Yeah, he was never, despite the fact that his personality might have seemed abrasive to people, but he was never kind of like, his ego was there, but he was always willing to bring people up and be like, we are a collective. It's not just me making this movie. You know, some directors might think it's just them making a movie. It's like, no, there's a whole crew of people. You're just one of them. He was the Joey Gantner of filmmakers, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Hey. (laughs) But it's just the way he would he would build people up like he is yeah uh, if you got a compliment from him like you would just be over the moon i'd imagine like he just really his compliments were as good as his criticisms you know like they just were as uh, direct and, and beautifully put the movie itself is like a movie how trust is bad but the uh-huh. process of making the movie is how trust is good you know like yeah <laughs> it's interesting you know contrasting yeah you in know. life don't trust people in work trust people are there any other points you want to talk No, I about? think we really well covered it. Um, I think we did. A fantastic movie. We did a, a, such an awesome job getting into this. And yet at the same time, like watch the movie. There's so much. Oh, yeah. Even though you watched it before listening to this episode. Or yeah, you're watch like, it again. I've seen it before. I can listen to this safely. Time to fire it up. Kino just came out with a, a new version that's available in all formats, I believe. Maybe even DVD for those still holding out. It's a great package, it's a great film, one you want on your shelf. 10 out of 10. I'm glad I chose it. But again, hardest choice of my life. Repo Man is yeah. so good. This, uh, well, we're going to come back for Repo Man. So we are absolutely. It's like it worked. It worked. Exactly. It better. So we'll do a whole Repo Man special with the out of, out of the podcast crew. Hell yeah. No, I mean, it's it's cool. Like you can you can come into this and be like, oh, I want to watch all freaking movies and they're all great. Mm-hmm. But Robbie Mueller is just a cinematographer that he just really, I don't know if these projects chose him or he chose them, but mm-hmm. he, he has a great, great filmography that you can trust. Which is a great segue <laughs> to the end credits section. Yes. I got two questions for you. All right. First question is, if someone is starting to view films from the cinematography side heard about robbie mueller has never seen any film that he's worked on they come to you and they're like hey where should i start do you recommend this film if so why if not what other films of his would you recommend i think nine times out of ten i would recommend this film first um just because it's Mm -hmm. a perfect segue for anybody like you know, yeah. if they don't like this movie, they're just like, I don't think I could relate to you. It's not like, all right, let's just <laughs> find your taste. It's like this one is like, yeah. this is as crowd pleasing as you can get mm-hmm. for like fucking normal people. And also like people who appreciate stuff like it's all there. It's yeah. rewarding for everybody. But I mean, again, he has such a, a wonderful filmography, you know. Yeah. Who, who am I talking to? Are you a little bummed out? Go watch in Paris, Texas, you know? Are you, mm-hmm. are you just some like weird pretentious friend that I'm trying to relate to? Down by law. It's got Tom <laughs> That's people love that. I would suggest this because it's a great film and it is just like it works for everybody. It's a skeleton key of a movie. They don't yeah. get better than that. No, that's a great answer. I think when sometimes you want to curate it to the person themselves, but if you want to give something that's like a blank check in a certain way, of like this is who this person is, this is what their work is, this is what I'm going to recommend. If you don't like this, then I don't know where you can go from here. Truly. And if you do, then there's like a wealth of other films you can go from here. So I think this is great. I would recommend this or Paris. You're Texas. rarely gifted in life like an option. Of yeah. Like, what, what is a, a movie that's really going to like just test a person and if I should like them and continue speaking <laughs> with them? This is it. Yeah. And then we could be like, oh, you liked it? Now let's see Paris, Texas. Let's peel this onion and see how far we can go. I have some of those films too where I'm just like, I don't know how talk to you if you don't like this movie mm-hmm. where I, I just don't feel like i we're gonna get along to be honest we can pretend yeah but 
it's not going to be true and genuine. So let's just stop it here. There's bands <laughs> like that. There's TV shows like that. We all got those testers where it's like, yeah. look, this is the thing that somehow as a society, we all came together on. Are yeah. you in? Are you out? Because <laughs> we already decided. That That's also ties in now to the double bill question. So oh, wow. look at me. Which is the last question yes. of the, the show. If you're building a double bill, either for yourself or for someone else, what film would you pair this with? You can pick more than one because I know it's sometimes you want to go for a different vibe. So just hit me with as many as you would pair this with and why. So you have, it's kind of like three facets here that I would Mm -hmm. be pairing this with. If you're going like, all right, hey, I'm watching this. I really enjoy this Peterson fellow. Look at this guy. stuff. I just saw his dick. I'm on board. Yeah. Let's watch the Manhunter too. That's that's going to be a perfect one-two punch. I mean, I think that's pretty obvious. I'm not, you know, I, that's good. Seen, I saw Fear. I don't think I'm going back. You know, <laughs> TV CSI. Who knows? We'll see. Retirement's coming someday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm going Friedkin, boy, tough call. Uh, you know, if you're like, oh, if you're pairing it car chase wise, you know, you go French Connection or Jade mm-hmm. if you really want to mix it up. But I would probably say Sorcerer. I, I think okay. uh, as far as the te- the tension goes and as far as like, I think those are my two favorite films from this filmmaker. Those are good. I mean, shout out to The Exorcist. I mean, that's like almost like oh, yeah. above. It's it's like so above, like it's just such a, uh, a achievement of yeah. everything, you know? Um, yeah. And I'm not like a horror guy, but I just, I really, I have an appreciation for that movie. Mm-hmm. I'm also not a horror person and neither really is my sister who she's not. My both my siblings are into they like movies, but they're not uh, a weirdo like I am, who's like another level of it. But I remember watching The Exorcist with her years and years back, and even she liked that. That's how you know. So you know when you show a movie to someone, you're like, yeah. If, even if that person likes it, it's how you know it's a good movie. And she, we always talk about The Exorcist. The Exorcist is like its own it's section a, it's a, of cinema. It's like a film that just happens to terrify the shit out of you. Like, yeah, because no horror movie has ever been that good. Like, no, even like ones I like, like are still never that good. Like that is just no. incredible. That's one that sticks forever. Truly. And it's its own thing. Like, I can't double feature that because you're going to need to, like, chill and, like, mm-hmm. think about yeah. it after that. <laughs> no, that's like you double feature it with bed. Yeah, you know, exactly. You watch it and you go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> you really want to be alone with your thoughts now, don't you? Um, but for Mueller, I th- you know, spoiler, it's going to be Repo Man. Like, yeah. this, this and Repo Man, I mean, that's a party right there. Uh, you're going to have a great time. I don't know if it's necessarily the most, like, artistic of choices, but mm-hmm. You know, I, if you're pairing this as a double feature, I think that's what goes best with that. If you're doing like a Paris, Texas or something, you have a lot more options. You can keep mm-hmm. it pretty low key, but you know, yeah. you're trying to rock and roll. Everybody's going to wang chun tonight. You know, that's, that's <laughs> how we're doing it. I would love to watch a double feature of To Live and Die in L.A. and Repo Man. I should have done it. I think that would be a great, great one. It really works. The ones that I went with, and I'm glad that it doesn't overlap, but I think. Oh, good. And like thematically they do. So I picked two. The first, I don't know. It just was the vibes. I think it was score wise, era wise. I went with Thief, the Michael Mann film. I just think those would be two good kind of fast paced, you know, crime films. Very much so. Very different, different style actors. You got your Peterson versus Khan. It's just a it's a hot test for me. It really is like the the polar opposite, uh, even like cinematography wise. It's like everything Mm -hmm. Mueller like wasn't doing. Yeah. (laughs) But it's still fantastic and and beautiful. Like I'm thief is it's Michael Mann. It's the Michael Mann look. It's it's awesome. Exactly. And then the other one, because one thematically well, there's kind of like a race against time in this film, and it's very LA. And it's a film I know you also love and that I want more people to watch, which is Miracle Mile. Oh, my God. I would pair it with that. I think oh it'd be a great God. L.A. double feature. Oh, my God. It's a great that'd film. Be so good. Right? Miracle Mile is the greatest film of all time. You just you just started up a whole other hour of this podcast for me. To I was. You. Well, no, because <laughs> no, because I was going. I know I've already asked you in this podcast now, like seven times. You're going to come on for this one, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're going to be on the podcast like several times. But. I was like, you have to do Miracle Mile with me because I need to talk about Miracle Mile. I need to talk about it. I need to talk about Miracle Mile like on a daily basis. It is. <laughs> it's so good. Oh, yeah. It's great. And I think it's like, it's so L.A. and the darkness of L.A. 
with a little Tangerine Dream soundtrack too. Yeah. That would be a good theme month uh, if you're trying to like figure out how to yeah. like, put that in there is Tangerine Dream. I don't know if you're going to uh, scores yet, but. I mean, I would love to, but I do want to branch out. So, but yeah, those would be my, my pairings for to live I'll in go to that. LA. I'll buy a ticket. That sounds great. Why not? I don't know what the order would be that I would have to think about, but I think those would be good ones. And yours are equally as great. I would also pair this movie with the uh, YouTube clip of uh, <laughs> a freaking talking to the director of Drive. Yeah. <laughs> totally just shutting him down. Hilarious. Yeah. Destroying like, his entire life. He, so he took it fairly well, though. I think no. I would be like, I need to leave now and cry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I enjoy Drive too, but uh, it was it was a, a very worthy yeah. des- destroying of. <laughs> yeah, it, it was as you said, factual. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Factual like, he, destruction. He, he is very uh, like blunt, but when you actually listen to what he's saying, you're like, I don't see the, anything yeah. wrong with what you've said. Yeah, William. Friedman. Yes, sometimes someone hits you with such a strong and accurate fact that you're just like, damn, I wasn't ready for it. I, I got one of those. Are you ready for it? Yes. I had a wonderful time today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. I was so excited to have you. Well, I've already forced you into several future episodes. Yes. It's on record <laughs> now. You can Oh, you almost have out. a co-host at this point. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> I cannot wait for those future ones, but it was so great to talk about To Live and Die in LA. I was so psyched to do this. I was so psyched to be here and talking with you. I always enjoy our conversations. And I'm glad yes. To- but if you want to hear more of Joey's voice, he's got a whole podcast. Yeah, there's a new episode out at this point. I'm going to put the pressure on myself to finish the yeah. latest episode and have it out Please. by this point. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm waiting for the Phantom <laughs> Lady episode. <laughs> that is my favorite noir. But there's so many other great episodes. It's a good episode, too. It's not even like I've been slacking on it. Like, oh, we really blew mm-hmm. it. It's like a good episode. So, well, yeah. there you go. We're coming back hot. And it was that episode <laughs> and everybody's already heard it. And they're like, wow, that what, what a podcast. I'm, I now have to struggle to choose between podcasts again. <laughs> well, Joey, thank you so much. I appreciate your time and I can't wait to have you back on. Looking forward to it. Seeing Faces and Movies is an official podcast of the Royal Film Club. It's hosted and edited by Felicia Maroney with intro music by Lamar Walker. If you like what you heard, let us know at seeingfacesandmovies.com or send us an email at seeingfacesandmovies at gmail.com. And while you're at it, please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to your podcast. And stay tuned for our next episode on Mystery Train.